Magandang gabi, Amerika mula sa Pilipinas. Good evening everyone. America is in pain. The pandemic of racism in the United States has suddenly exploded, infecting major cities across the globe amid the world's continuous battle with the coronavirus pandemic. To help us understand the systemic racism and racial biases in the U.S., we will be joined by Filipino professors teaching in American universities. We have with us Dr. Raymond Narag, Associate Professor from Southern Illinois University, Dr. Sharon Kinsat, Assistant Professor from Grinnell College in Iowa, and Dr. Christopher Magno, Associate Professor from Cannon University in Pennsylvania. Kamusta kayo sa Amerika? Mabuti naman po. <laughs> Sige, let's uh, start with our conversation. Okay, um, the U.S. was founded by pluralism and slavery at the same time it has brought so many colors to its narrative of global superiority on geopolitics and predominance on pop culture. Sharon, can you share with us your views on why the U.S. has become the epicenter of this pandemic on racism and uh, how does the American society cope up with this mistake of uncertainty and violence amid the coronavirus uh, pandemic? Yeah, yeah. So, um well, we, we can understand the persistence of racism in the United States and why we have the protests right now by tracing the history of the nation. So mm -hmm. we know that the history of the United States is a history of settler colonialism. So mm -hmm. the founding of a state based on the ideology of white supremacy that led to land theft and genocide of Native Americans. And, and settler colonialism as, a, as an institution or, or system requires violence or the threat of mm -hmm. violence to attain its goal. So to build the nation, of course, the European colonizers needed labor. So through slavery and imperialism. So we are talking here of, as you already mentioned, systemic racism built into society. So it includes the uh, sort of like complex array of, of anti-black practices, unjustly mm. gained political economic power of whites, continuing uh, economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, of course, and, and white racist ideologies and attitudes created to maintain and rationalize white privilege and power. So race here reflects power relations in society, and it has both material and ideological dimensions. So we see this if we connect it to, you know, uh, as you mentioned, the coronavirus self-emergency. We see this right now in the COVID pandemic with Blacks being disproportionately right, affected right. because they are employed in high-risk jobs jobs, they don't have access to health care, they, they have pre-existing conditions tied to inability to access healthy food, for instance, and yet the way white politicians um, and analysts have justified this uh, disparities in COVID race is that they just have, you know, bad diet and alcoholism, mm. so different cultural explanations. So uh, what we're trying to say here is despite the end of slavery and, and Jim Crow laws, racism was not really addressed in its core and its roots, you know, tied to capitalism and white supremacy. So we see the persistence of overt practices in policing, but also on ones that are less, you know, covert, uh, overt, sorry. It's mm -hmm. often the language of, of equality and meritocracy, for instance. So in other words, there's a hugot no, in uh, Filipino <laughs> parlance there, right? But, but uh, studies, yeah, 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 studies would show that, um, you know, uh, whites are becoming the minorities in the states. How come that uh, this uh, um, uh, battle of races uh, is st are still ongoing? Uh, oh, do you want me to? Uh, yeah, yeah, please, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. Up uh, for that. So as I said, like, uh, you know, it, it, the, we're, we're not talking about like slavery right now, okay. like slavery or segregation, but it has, it has transformed the nature of, of, um, of racism, of, of racist practices. So for instance, the, the rational for colorblind practices mm -hmm. is that racism and race privilege no longer exercise the power they once did. And, you know, we need to be treating people equally leads to more equal society. But mm -hmm. commitment to the principle of equality in that, that sense, and I think you highlighted later earlier about pluralism, actually, mm -hmm. it serves to perpetuate inequality. So in a system mm -hmm. where inequality based on, on race and ethnicity is built into the structure of society, 
uh, we, when we are unwilling to address these issues explicitly because we say that, you know, we have to go by meritocracy, we mm -hmm. are actually perpetuating the status quo. Right, right. Now, Raymond, as a professor teaching in American, uh, Americans at the university, uh, can you share with us here in the Philippines the state of uh, systemic racism and racial bias in American institutions and perhaps the day-to-day -day life? Did you see this coming, that kind of uh, phenomenological, cultural, social backlash will erupt against the background, backdrop, of, uh, the backdrop of the upcoming presidential election in the U.S.? Okay, yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, those questions are, I think, uh, three layered. So I'll first uh, answer the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm teaching here uh, as a criminal justice uh, professor, and I teach, uh, you know, prisons, um, policing, and also the court systems. Right. And you are right, uh, in the criminal justice system, um, there is what we call disproportionate minority contact. Mm -hmm. um, African Americans and other minorities are more likely to be arrested by the police. And when they are arrested, they are more likely to be prosecuted uh, by the prosecutors, indicted in the courts. And if they are sentenced, they are more likely to be in prison rather in probation. And when in prison, they are more likely to be sentenced for longer terms uh, compared uh, all other uh, variables considered uh, compared to their white counterparts. And um, we see this um, implicit bias, okay? Um, that is very recurring simply because of products also of um, politics and even of research. So for example, in policing, we have what we call the notion of hot spots policing, mm -hmm. where police would concentrate their limited resources into areas where crimes are more likely to happen. Unfortunately, in America, crime is you know, place-based, you know, uh, places where there's concentrated disadvantage, uh, places where there's a high uh, areas of poverty. Um, and unfortunately, these are also the same places where African Americans and most minorities live. Mm -hmm. And so, um, despite the fact that the police, you know, has the intention of reducing crime in these uh, hot spots areas, the um, natural after effect is that they are more likely to police or over police these um, racial communities. And so what we see is that there's an implicit bias where resources mm -hmm. are geared towards their um, policing and also incarceration and such. And we can see that these um, criminal justice conditions are also seen in other areas of concerns like education, you know, they are more likely to uh, not finish high school or they are more likely not to enter college or in health disparities, okay? So all of these, uh, when we teach it, we, we share it to our students and our students try to uh, look at it from a sociological and historical perspective. Mm -hmm. I do believe that there are many young Americans uh, trying to embrace stay woke in a word, nagigising na sila. Right. But the underbelly of America, as what Sharon had mentioned a while ago, there's this um, hidden, nakatago eh. Mm -hmm. And with the rise of conservatism, and especially with President Trump right now, where that is his base, and he continually right. strikes at them, nagpupush back, nagpupush back. Mm -hmm. And so all some of the gains that they had, that we had here in America in the past 60 years or so, since the civil rights movement, so we were hoping that tuloy tuloy na yan, damat siya. But then, because of this underbelly, they are pushing back. And so ngayon, we are really a convulsing nation. So yan yun, uh, phenomenologically, yan yung experiences ng mga right, tao right. ngayon. So, but, but um, what about the uh, <clears throat> chilling effect of that, um, of that uh, widespread uh, protest in the States? Um, what is the current pulse of the American society in terms of debates, narratives, discourses, after the sudden death of Arbery, Floyd, and Taylor? Yes, I think that is a good sign. Um, most white uh, Americans, um, Caucasian Americans that I've met and I've seen, and even in the academia, are now basically voicing uh, their opinions out. Even young children, teenagers, are really organizing themselves, even in rural communities, usually very conservative areas. Even in my hometown here in Carbondale, we have a, a very large gathering of um, Americans of, from all colors, okay, expressing mm -hmm. uh, their uh, opposition to this um, racial inequality. 
and I do hope that you'll be sustained up until the coming elections, okay? Um, but what I also fear is the pushback from the other side because all lives matter now are also gaining steam and they are also becoming more organized. And in America, who's the group that brings people in the polls more efficiently and organizationally usually wins the elections as well. And so I do hope that all these social, cultural, and political developments eventually translate into electoral changes as well. Right, right. Chris, uh, you wrote a powerful piece on the imperialism of race, class, rights, and patronage in the Philippines, which you argued, let me quote, in tandem with establishing the legal boundaries of citizenship, during the American period, politicians and media extended a race-based system of governance through speeches and graphic caricatures that racialized Filipinos as underdeveloped and threatening. Can you further expound this colonial mentality that have been embedded as a microchip on Filipino minds that runs through our consciousness on Philippine culture and history? Yeah, before I answer that question, I just want to react about the uh, diversity questions that you asked right, to right. Sharon and to Ray and the hotspot that mentioned by Raymond. Uh, diversity of colors cannot address racism. Mm. We have Filipinos and Asians who are who are also racist. Actually, there's mm. uh, there's some and there's a lot of Filipinos who voted for the racist uh, president, which is President Trump. Mm. Um, most of the Filipino Americans, especially here in Erie, Pennsylvania, I became a president of the Filipino American uh, Association for three years uh, here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Most Filipinos here, they are married to a racist white male uh, vocation. And they met them online or through the mail order bride. And it's, you know, Mail ordered bride concept, you know, the concept of mail ordered bride or the practice of mail ordered bride is also uh, a racist, a racist practices. And about the hotspot that mentioned by Raymond, a uh, hotspot became a hotspot because it's the frequent uh, policing and, you know, and um, searches, uh, practices of the police officers. And that's the reason it became a hotspot. I've been teaching crime mapping for several years now at Gannon University. And every time they ask me why it is a hot spot of crime, it's because that's the focus of policing. If you're gonna focus your policing in upper class neighborhood, then the upper class neighborhood will become a hot spot, not right, the right. not the um, the urban poor neighborhood or the lower income neighborhood. So I just want to say that the the racist practices in the United States it it trans it translate into class based discrimination in the Philippines. So if the 70% of prison population in, in the United States are people of color, 90 or 95% of prison population in the Philippines are the poor. Mm -hmm. According to uh, the record of the Human Rights Commission right now, I'm documenting all the killings, the extrajudicial killings in the Philippines and I'm, I'm mapping it and writing a paper on epidemiology of violence in the Philippines. Oh, Most of the victims of extrajudicial killings are the poor. The war against drugs in the Philippines is the war against the poor. And it's the same thing here um, in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, how, how it translates. And, you know, we can talk about colonialism when the United States went to the Philippines and before mm -hmm. they arrived to to the Philippines to colonize us, like the United States before they colonized us. We are educated, we are civilized, and yet they caricatured our identity. So I also studied how they distort the Filipino identity so that they can convince the American uh, citizens, but back, back then they don't have a television and radio. So they use caricatures to convince the American public that we need to civilize and educate uh, the Filipino people, because they are evil, uh, they are, you know, diseased, you know, they caricatured us like a, yeah, a mosquito. The white man's burden, right? That's right, the white man's burden. So, uh, so there's always, you know, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you talk about, I was thinking about the microchip, the microchip here is the superiority complex, the binary mm -hmm. opposition, because mm -hmm. the binary opposition enhance superiority, you know, in terms of governance like Trump, you know, and Duterte's war on drugs, they always need to criminalize a certain population. 
in the United States, they criminalize the people of color. Most of the campaign against, you know, against immigrants, against uh, black population. It's about racism. Because if you don't criminalize a certain population, your rhetoric of the war on drugs and your uh, superiority uh, image cannot be enhanced. So there's always a binary opposition that it enhances your superiority. And the, on the other hand, it's also degrade the identity of the other. But, 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 but um, before there was United States, it was also colonized, the also underground uh, inferiority complex there. They had uh, colonialism also as a, as a problem in the past. But uh, I, um, as they go on with their history, they become a superpower. And uh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, can you, like can in you the Philippines or the United States? I mean, yeah, it's, it's the same. Yeah, it's it's the same. You know, it's the same in any in any country. You know, like uh, in in the Philippines, for example, we've been colonized by by the Spaniards, and yet that type of colonization by the Spaniards was enhanced more by the Americans. Were colonized through education, through the economy, uh, through governance, right? So, and through through culture. You know the the you know like kailangan maputi tayo di ba? <laughs> Kasi yun yung definition natin ng beauty. Tapos yeah. lahat ng mga product, all the advertisement in the television and radio and print ads, it's all about and even the the entertainment industry, it's always about you know uh, mestizo as being uh, superior beauty uh, or maputi di ba? So Yun, yun yung mentality eh. That's the microchip embedded on us, right? That's the microchip embedded on us. It's all about superiority. You mm -hmm. know, whatever mm -hmm. uh, field that you're gonna, you know, in the field of government, uh, in the field of entertainment, right, in the culture right. and economic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is uh, for all of you. Um, we see uh, the widespread uh, riot all over, uh, across uh, the states. And uh, it is the language of the unheard, uh, says the Guardian. But what if violence is it the way and racism in America? Then what is it? Maybe the lady first, Sharon. Yeah. So, um, well, even like the the language that we use, for example, when when blacks or you know um, Latinos protest, they often use the term riot, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Uh, sort of like um, portray this as not having legitimate grievances, you know, mm -hmm. or, or claims and demands. Uh, so first we have to talk about like how uh, it is framed by the media as this is something like a riot. So there's immediately an association of it like being violent and also um, people not having any political agenda at all that is not rooted on something uh, within built in in the structures, as I as I said before. But mm -hmm. also we were um, the way we have been talking about it. And when we say we like um, Americans, like both like you know uh, of diff of uh, various persuasions is that you know we we can't use violence in order to attain our goals but uh with all the protests it has been what like uh, i think almost two weeks right mm -hmm. what have they attained so far there's a large-scale change already going on in terms of defunding the police or uh, police being held accountable so there are outcomes that have been achieved um, right. And that like have not been achieved through vote because there's that threat. There's that threat of an uprising. There's that threat of uh, people like coming together and the power of the people out in the streets. So uh, when we say that, you know, violence isn't the way to end racism in America, who is saying this? So right. we again have to address the power dimension. Uh, and I think that like a lot of protesters have been saying that you can't tell us how to protest. So even that alone, like defining what is the appropriate way to um, to make claims or demands from uh, the government or from the state or from society at large is already racist in a sense, because it is only prescribing a certain way of doing protests. Okay, Raymond, from a uh, criminal justice uh, perspective, so how will this end? I mean, it's uh, <laughs> prevalent all over. 
Well, I do believe America is listening. And, you know, America mm. is a union. It's not a perfect union, mm. but they are trying to perfect the union. And credit mm. that to the establishment of the uh, democratic order. Okay, it has its faults and its warts, but at least um, there's checks and balances. People are uh, voicing out and their voices are eventually trickling into the uh, political system. And as uh, you have heard from Sharon, she says that because of these voices, there are now calls for uh, defunding the police. Uh, mm -hmm. There are now calls for restructuring, restructuring the police. Uh, some police organizations who have been traditionally you know, anti-reforms are now slowly um, embracing these uh, changes. And um, we have done this already in the past, you know, since the 19... Uh, 60s and 70s when um, the U.S. government recognized that there are problems in the criminal justice system, uh, they've been trying to introduce changes in the way policing are done. So, for example, community policing, okay, uh, where they would want to get the police officers out uh, from their cars and from their horses and walk with these uh, individuals into the streets and to the communities. They've been trying to introduce these little changes, of course, Okay, and through the years, it's a um, pendulum. It's, you know, sometimes they gain some inroads, sometimes uh, the other side push back, okay? So it's a matter of battling out America's hearts and soul, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why these coming elections uh, in November is sort of a referendum. Where will mm -hmm. America go? What soul wins out? Is it the voices of democracy? Is it the voices of um, celebrating diversity? Or it, will it be the other side where there is this um, supremacy still among the white uh, public uh, dominating the consciousness? So um, I do believe more organizing is done, more conscientizing needs to be done mm -hmm. so that these voices are eventually um, enmeshed into the political system. Of course, violence is not the solution and violence is not the only solution. But I do believe that this, pro this protest are making inroads okay, into the democratic spaces. Right, right. Please, we've seen a wave of uh, influence all over the world from America. Now it's exporting this uh, pandemic of racism. Uh, what can you say about that? Um, what I can say based in, in my experience here in Erie, uh, I used to teach race and class and diversity class uh, at Gannon. And then I stopped teaching as teaching that course because my students accused me as uh, being racist mm -hmm. and it's hard it's it's really hard to talk about race among white students mm -hmm. okay african-american students i have two or three or five they will understand it but they're going to be so quiet inside the classroom mm -hmm. because it's dominated by the uh, opinion of the white uh, mm -hmm. students but now it just totally changed uh, the bishop, which is the chair of the board of Gannon, uh, led a silent protest last Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that action, Gannon University right now is going to uh, address uh, racism through a series of uh, forum and dialogues, uh, course offerings and changes. So uh, it's gonna be uh, embedded uh, the approach of addressing racism is going to be embedded throughout the university from top to the bottom. Okay. So, uh, maybe, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe for my last question for all of you here, um, diversity of races is the strength of America. And uh, if health and racial pandemic will uh, further escalate in America and President Trump will remain in office until 2025, how would you see the future of the United States? Maybe we start from uh, Raymond. Well, um, for me, um, that's a very grim scenario indeed. Um, um, I do believe that America is still the leader of the democratic world. Um, mm -hmm. They have been doing a lot of research um, in health um, and other areas. And America's leadership is very important at this very moment. But if the grim scenario that you have mentioned really pans out and um, America will um, sort of mawawala siya dun sa role niya ito, and then it will become very isolationist, okay? Mm. And then, of course, um, hindi niya nakasama yung ibang bansa uh, in working out with solutions, especially with this pandemic. Uh, 
then um, I am very, very concerned about what's in it for the future. So it's like But a demotion I, for the U.S.? That is very correct. Mm -hmm. But I do hope that, you know, um, people will, with more enlightened minds, you know, people who are, have been awakened um, will take that stance, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I, I have trust in these uh, young people that they will come out strong um, in, in these coming elections. Right, right. Uh, Sharon, um, the U.S. has been uh, slashing um, China for its um, uh, health virus, and now you, we see some um, re, uh, racism pandemic coming from the states. Uh, do you see any backlash from its position as a superpower? Well, like in terms of uh, the again, like mobilization of, of young people, that's what uh, Raymond said. You have a lot of people coming out addressing that. Uh, and, you know, like uh, you, you were saying before, like, what if Trump gets elected? Um, and, and we just can't think about, like, uh, if, we, if we take out, like, Trump, like, out of the office, then, then systemic racism will go away. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it is embedded in the fabric of American society. And even how they get, uh, how, like, a lot of white politicians get consent from minorities themselves, that this is an issue of uh, blacks, for instance, race is an issue of blacks. No, it's an issue for, for everyone. As, um, as what uh, Chris said, even among Filipinos, Asian Americans, they do uh, contribute to systemic racism in a way, but they are also, like we said, like with the blaming of, of China and, and Asians as people who are bringing this virus, they are also uh, victims of systemic racism mm -hmm. at the same time that they are participants, active participants in perpetuating a racist society. Right, right. Chris, um, how would uh, the Philippines uh, treat uh, the United States if uh, this will uh, keep on going? I mean, racism is uh, embedded in the American culture and society. Then uh, how, do we, how do we look up at uh, America in the future? Um, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> there's still a lot of Filipinos who want to go to the United States, yeah, of, yeah, course, of course, and there's still a lot of Filipina who wants to marry an American. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, um, being a global citizen, uh, it helps, it helps a lot. Um, it enlightens uh, so many Filipinos because when they get out of our country, they see how the other nation and countries work. Mm -hmm. And actually in, in one of my papers, that's, that's one of the reason why the 31, uh, mm -hmm. the 31 because uh, people are really looking for a leader, leadership and governance that they observe outside of the Philippines. And most of the countries where they, where they go, like the United States and Canada and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, um, where most of the Filipinos go to work, they observe that they have a very, uh, a very good law and order uh, policy and implementation. You know, uh, mm -hmm. people people follow the law and it, it's implemented really well. And they really thought that Duterte is going to do that in the Philippines, and that's the reason. You know, most of the OFW uh, voted for uh, elected uh, Duterte, mm -hmm. and. In terms of an alternative, um, or you know, like if you're gonna make the United States as as a model, you know, or how are we gonna be relating with the U.S. Uh, right now uh, because of this issue of racism? I think we need to we need to reexamine our own uh, ways of of governance, mm -hmm. and you know that uh, Duterte through his uh, bravado uh, diba? Mm. Uh, projection that anti-Americans, you know, being an anti-imperialism and anti-Americans, mm. they actually back out, you know, what happened to the BFA, the Visiting mm. Forces Agreement that he really, you know, uh, wants to reject and now they, they don't want to reject it anymore. They suspended and it. They suspended it. That's right. The process of rejection of the BFA. And I think the anti-terror bill is the result of that good relationship with the United States. I think they're going to get huge amount of money from the U.S. Mm -hmm. They're not getting money right now from the United States because they, 
they they are about to uh, repeal the visiting forces agreement. So now they are not mm -hmm. repealing uh, BFA, and now they are going to legislate and sign. You know, Duterte is going to sign the the anti-terrorism bill mm -hmm. to get the the anti-terrorism uh, money that they used to get, and they it stopped because they are going to repeal the BFA. Mm -hmm. So now the United States is demanding more. You know, don't repeal the BFA, and then you need to legislate this. Okay, mga kababayan, magpasalamat tayo sa ating mga bisita. Uh, the, the conversation is very powerful, uh, direct to the point, and of course, very clever. Thank you, uh, Dr. Narag, Dr. Magno, and Dr. Kinsaat. Maraming salamat sa inyo. Maraming Thank salamat you. din. Maraming salamat din.